Hello out there, everybody. It's Pam here from the Dick Biondi film, uh, my passion project for the last six years. And I'm here today with a couple of very special guests. Um, these guys worked with Dick Biondi way back in the old WJMK days. And they're gonna tell some stories about Dick and about the old radio days, working with all the legends. So uh, I'm gonna let you guys introduce yourself. Kevin, would you like to go first? Uh, Kevin Robinson. I'm a stay-at-home alcoholic. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe that. Uh, <laughs> been in radio for almost 40 years. Uh, currently a broadcast and small business strategic consultant uh, working out of my home in Indianapolis, the Indianapolis area. I worked at WJMK for 10 years from 92 to 2002. Uh, various on-air configurations. Uh, Dick was there the entire time. Um, yeah, I, I since left and went to uh, St. Louis um, for 12 years after my Chicago stint, uh, was a vice president for Hot AC for CBS for uh, a couple of years, um, consulted Westwood One for a couple of years, mm. and now out of the corporate grind, if you will, and glad to be, and I have half dozen small market mostly family owned clusters of radio stations that I coach not only from branding from a, but also from a coaching standpoint. And I really like working with young talent to make sure that they're up and coming and doing it the right way. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dick Biondi on several levels could be a role model for a lot of these contemporary talent that are, that I'm working with. So uh, glad to contribute. Uh, he's been, uh, you know, when I arrived in Chicago and, in 1992, I was a 31-year-old kid in a suit that thought I had all the answers, and it was far from it. Uh, I learned from guys like Dick and Scott and uh, Land Decker, Sean Burke, um, Bob Dearborn, Bob Hale, Clark Weber, the guys I worked with in that building at the time, much more, much more than they ever learned from me. I'm a better program director because of the talent I worked with uh, uh, in that building there at uh, on. Uh, high above the Albon Payne, right, Scott? That was, yeah. Yeah. That was uh, it. Back when we had a, a, an elevator operator. That's how <laughs> long ago it was. Wow. Um, that, so it was, yeah. it, it was a great time. <laughs> uh, our, our, our leader, Harvey Perlman, God rest his soul, had uh, wood panning all over, his, his, uh, all over his office. He was a guy who never went out for a haircut. The stylist came to him. Or a Manny Petty. He did it in his office. One of those guys always kept a bottle in his desk, a bottle, and uh, had a uh, almost life-size poster of Barbara Streisand in his bathroom. Remember that, Scott? <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't know that I was ever in his bathroom, but uh, I remember the wood paneling for sure. And yeah. uh, uh, since this is about Dick Biondi, uh, I remember I was at Harvey's uh, funeral because Harvey was living in, in Longbow Key, and that's where I lived at the time. And so I went to the funeral, and I called Biondi after, and he said, uh, thanks for being there. Now we know that he's gone. It was like, oh, my God. But uh, And the paneling, yeah, I certainly remember that. And I certainly remember Harvey, who uh, – Harvey was a New York bully. But Harvey was a very wise man, obviously, you know, very accomplished to get to that level. But he, he could be pretty gruff if you didn't give it back to him. And uh, many times I remember Biondi coming into the studio when I was still on the air, slamming the door and, and telling a story about, oh, Harvey just said this to me in the hallway. Why would he do that? And it's like, don't let him get to you, man. You're more important here than he is. Don't, you know, don't let him get to you. But uh, um, those days were, um, you know, in Biondi's career, they were late days. But in, in our career, that was just like, wow, we hit. Uh, just in time, because after that, boy, it went, you know, and I'm still in the business, so I got to be careful. But what a different business today than it was then. We just, we had fun every single day, and I still have fun every day, but there's so much more to do, and there's so much more. It's just a changed world. It's just so different now. But uh, why was it so different? Can you give us the audience a specific? It's just there's, there's fewer people in the business. Um, you know, the corporate, uh, most corporates are so in debt that they can't afford to have staffs. So, you know, you get more stuff piled on you. 
and um, it's a different world in that in our day, back in those days, radio was king. Now, you know, uh, I can't find mine, but the phone is the king now, and there's just so many more ways that you know, c compete for attention, for listeners' attention than just radio. Mm -hmm. So that has changed. I mean, the, the pie is different uh, for sure than it was, but- um, and, and the margins have changed. And the fact that uh, in, in consolidation in 1996 really was the, uh, the turning point. But when I joined, we had an operations manager. I was program director at WJMK. WJJD, we had a program director, uh, Rick- um, Patton. Patton, yeah, Rick Patton. And we had a full-time news director on WJMK, Richard Cantu. And we had a full-time news director on JJD, mm -hmm. uh, Kurt Schoey. So it was definitely a different time. Um, and, you know, we had uh, shorter shifts. Mm -hmm. We had, uh, I was an off-air program director. Mm -hmm. uh, we had uh, a full marketing staff. I had an off-air uh, assistant PD, um, music director. Uh, several of them, but they don't, you know, that right now a program director is usually over two or three stations and probably pulling an airship mm -hmm. it's just because of the margins. And we, we would, with Infinity, we would turn 50 to 55 cents on the dollar every year to profit. And we felt like we lost because USN down the road did 58 cents on the dollar, right. whereas uh, the people over at Bonneville would turn 32 cents on every dollar and they take everybody to the Bahamas and celebrate. Right, right. <laughs> so Absolutely. We, although we had fun every day, it, it, Harvey was a guy who, um, and Dick obviously has his own Harvey stories, but uh, he was a guy who never felt like you were winning, although we right. were. Right. The only time I felt like we were winning in the summer of 96 when we were number one overall for the first time right. forever. Right. And we had an all day party. It was, uh, I mean, he had Dom Perry on in the, in the conference room by noon. Wow. Um, but uh, it, it was just a different time. He was a, he was a different leader. He was very sharp off campus. He was like a, a grandfather to me. He'd take me golfing at right. the Grand Geneva where he had a club and, you know, he would talk much differently. I learned a lot from him. He opened up the books to me to, to show me wow. uh, a PL and an EBITDA and how you calculate um, different parts of the business. And that's, like really where, you. that's really where I became uh, more of a, uh, a less of a program director or more of a businessman. Right. Uh, within the, now, did he do anything like that with Dick? I mean, is, did Dick sort of, did they kind of rub each other all the time or what? I, I don't know that, I don't think, I don't think they rubbed at each other. I just think that, um, you, you know, in describing Harvey as a bully, I mean, I, I, I mean that with respect. He was just a tough guy, but if you, if you gave it back to him, he loved you for it. I, okay. you know, I could say stuff to him that was like, whoa, but he liked that because you're giving it back to him. Yeah. Um, Dick was a pure talent. Dick never had any, as far as I ever knew, had any inkling that he was going to be programming or management at all. He was like, no, keep me away from the suits. He, he just wanted to be an air talent. Yeah, and I kind of straddled sure. because my first ever job I became the program director at. So I, I kind of did both things. And, you know, I mean, my thing at JMK was just ride this out because it was fun. They paid us well. We didn't have to work to. I was four and hit the door. I mean, it was like that was all that was expected. Just do a good air shift and get out of here and enjoy nice. your life. So and tell us um, some of the uh, crazy things that, you know, because John Landecker was there and Greg Brown and, and, you know, all those guys. Name all the guys and tell us some of the crazy things that you used to do. Because I heard from Landecker, he's in our film. Greg mm -hmm. Brown is in our film. Uh, he, uh, they were telling me that they had more fun off the air than on the air. So I would love to hear some of those stories. I'm sure everybody listening would, would like to hear them. Well, uh, you know, if Dick you can. <laughs> when, when I, yeah, exactly. When I got to JMK, uh, Dick lived right across the street in the, uh, uh, what's the Durrell. name of the building? Uh, Durrell. Durrell? Yeah, that's what, that's what it was called at the time. Durrell Plaza. And, yeah. and so he, uh, he lived right across the street. So, um, you know, and I lived downtown and, and uh, um, I was commuting. So I was there all week alone. And uh, so he would like kind of, he took me on my wing and it was like, come on, I got, you got to introduce you to this guy and I got to introduce you to that guy. And we would have lunch and stuff. And it's amazing the number of people 
Um, you know, I've worked all over this two countries and um, the, the number of people that I've worked with that are huge and, you know, have great ratings and earn a whole bunch of money. Dick was probably as popular as anybody I've ever come across in radio in that all these years later, hey, I listened, I grew up listening to you in 1960 constantly. I mean, you have lunch and it was like, it was 10 minutes of eating and 50 minutes of people coming to the table and, and, you know, Hey Dick, uh, you know, can I get your autograph and stuff like that? Um, not a lot of people in this country were that big as Dick was in his heyday in Chicago. And, and he wrote it for, you know, I mean, for all those years, it was Dick Biondi. He, you yeah. know, and, and, you know, you talked earlier, Kevin, about, uh, about learning stuff and learning from Dick, Dick, you know, Dick took the stage and said, okay, I'm going to act on this stage. It's not just going to be a play. I'm going to stand out on this stage. And, and he was extremely effective of doing that to, to the point of, uh, he, he knew what the listeners were all about. And wasn't as concerned about what corporate was all about or what the latest consultant was saying or whatever else. Uh, yes, you know, he, he was, was fired more... 25 times during his career. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, you know, I mean, Dick is a fiery guy and, uh, you know, he, uh, you know, he might have, uh, you know, threw ashtrays at people or whatever he did. Uh, but he didn't tell that joke. That was Bob Hope. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, he, um, he, he enjoyed himself. He lived to be on the radio each and every day. Yes, and, um, and no, I mean, I, I lived, I mean, I get up at three twenty in the morning, actually three twenty one, three two one. 21, go, the alarm goes off and I get up and say, man, I get to do this again today. And, you know, I haven't done it as long as Dick has. But I'm, I'm, you know, I'm between 45 and 50 years doing this. And it's like, I don't want to stop this. This is too much fun. But nobody, nobody anywhere had the passion that Dick did to be on the air every day. He lived when, for it. When I, when I arrived in 92, I was like, I was hired at JMK to bring uh, forward. Mo I was the top 40 guy. So right. I was, you know, I didn't know 40% of the playlist. But I walked in with the suit, act like I knew what I was doing. And I didn't. So I had a lot to learn from a lot of different people in that building on both sides, uh, on the AM and the, and the FM, and I, and I did. Uh, it was humbling uh, after the first six months. And, and I went from you know, trying to be the smartest guy in the room to trying to be uh, the most educated guy in the room. And when I first had heard Dick Biondi when I was listening, and by the way, I, I did learn that I was the fifth guy that the job was offered to. The other wow. four guys said no because of the previously mentioned Harvey Perlman. Wow. So I took the bullet. Yeah. <laughs> I took the bullet, and uh, and when I heard Dick, I'm like, I don't get it. Uh, I was probably a decade behind to really have the Dick Biondi gene, uh, mm -hmm. which I really learned to appreciate. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I would look, grew up listening to Landecker and Lou yeah. Jack and Little Tommy, um, sure. Ron Britton, uh, all those guys in the '70s of the CFL and LS days, and Dick was. Uh, on to different things. He, mm -hmm. he was a uh, network. He was at, uh, off, off on the East Coast for a while and things like that before he came back to magic in the early to mid, uh, in early to mid 80s. And they really, 84, yeah. Yeah, they, they, they really built that station around him. So, but I'm listening to him on the air before I even joined. I'm like, this guy? Really? <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking typical radio. Right. But Dick wasn't all about what he did on the radio. He was there in, in 1960, 61, and really became a rock star, he was most effective and more effective than anybody I've ever worked with. Anybody. I agree. One-on-one -on -one with people yes. on site. He would, he would kiss babies. He would hug people. And this was obviously way before the B2 movement. He would just hug beautiful women, uh, high-five guys. Uh, he hugged ugly he women. Hugged he hugged guys, too. He, he wasn't prejudicial. He, he hugged ugly <laughs> women, too. <laughs> and I, know, he's still I remember like that. Um, at one time, some sales guy sold a remote to a pawn shop in downtown Chicago. I'm I like, remember that. <laughs> a remote in a pawn shop at like 2 o'clock in the afternoon. <laughs> Got a lot of money. So Dick is doing this remote at, uh, at a pawn shop. <laughs> and we're lying to meet the guy. <laughs> I'm like, really? Yeah. But, but uh, I mean, he was, he was so gifted at touching people. That's what people remember about Dick Biondi. Yes. Not the fact that he, you know, could 
could say whatever in eight seconds over a lip of a record. Correct. It was how he touched people off air on site. As I remember that um, he was so popular. He did this 24 hour tour drive for, for many, many years, as you know, right. and um, at a mall. And at times he would be so overwhelmed and I would be on site or somebody else might be on site, one of our marketing people. And we, he'd come to me and say, can you be the bad guy? I really need a break. Can you tell them that I needed a break? I can't tell them that I needed a break. I don't want to say no to anybody. Right. So I have to go back and say, oh, Dick has got to go back right. and have a break. Yeah. Or, or he needs it. to leave at, at the end it's of the toy drive. Um, he really wanted to touch everybody. Uh, but also, as he got to the end of his stick, he would say, hey, somebody else be the bad guy here because I'm not going to be the bad guy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and all this is in our movie too. You know, we have the toy drive, we've got the pizza song, how that all came about. We've got this big firing, you know, with the, with the dirty joke. Did he tell it? Did he not tell it? You know, it was, some people swear they heard that dirty joke. Sure. And other people said, oh, he didn't tell it. So we're going to go through that whole story. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun when it's, when it's done. And we're almost there. Um, we just started working on getting pictures and uh, you know, all the good stuff that's going to make it really sing. One so of the things that I really uh, appreciate you guys do you, before we sign off, can you just give us one little uh, beyond you story each a little special, maybe well, a crazy my, thing that sticks in my mind isn't really a beyond story. But, you know, I, I come to Chicago, I'm 31 years old and skinny tie, lots of hair product. And I meet, <laughs> I meet, I meet this guy named Bob Surratt. And Bob comes up to me, he says, kid. And he's like adjusting my skinny black tie, <laughs> my, my shirt. He says, Bob's in our film too. I know. And Bob says, kid, Dick Biondi is a national treasure. You do anything to mess with him, you answer to me. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah. I love Isn't that. that. Great? Thank you. That's a great story. How about you, Scott? Uh, boy, there's just, there's just so many. And I, you know, I mean, name, you know, name a topic and I'll have a Dick Biondi story. But probably after I left um, uh, JMK at in, in the end of 2000, and Biondi would call me every week, what's going on? What's going on? What are you, you know, what are you doing? Where are you? And stuff like that. But I remember one time I was in Florida when I uh, lived in Florida. I still have the house there. Someday I'll get back. And um, he called me when I was at work and probably cell phones were new then, I don't know. But, uh, uh, and, and my operations manager who grew up in Grand Rapids, Michigan was in the studio and he goes, I go, here, take this call. It, t tell him how, how much you enjoyed listening to him back in the day, et cetera, et cetera. Who is it? I said, just, just get on the call and just talk to this guy. And he, was, he got off the call like, wow. Dick Beyond, he called you, and it's like, like he is, as as Kevin said, just like a treasure, but a, a national treasure, but larger than life. And uh, you know, God bless him. He, uh, uh, he he was quite he you know was quite a character on the radio for how many years? Look at that. Familiar. Yeah, the 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 change. I remember the the logo. I remember when they changed to that logo. Kevin was uh, certainly there for that. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Dick had this thing with me that, uh, and I feel he probably had it with everybody, but he never answered his phone on the first ring or even the first call. Uh -huh. If somebody called him back right away, then he would answer it. And anytime I had a conversation with him, uh, I would make sure that he, and it, he would tell me that he, he called his mother every day in New York. Yeah. yeah. And he would always ask me how Monica, my wife, was. Always. Mm. It, it was like he was really concerned with even more concerned with things going on in our lives than his life. That's um, right. And, and to a certain extent, very private when it comes to personal issues, but, yes. but very forthcoming and, and caring, knowing that, uh, that you were okay, your family's okay. Uh, is there anything I can do for you? He all, always asked. Mm -hmm. um, so he was just, and he still is, although we haven't talked for more than a decade and a half, actually, mm -hmm. uh, just, a, just a wonderful, wonderful human being. Really and is. thank you for doing this. Well, yeah, thank I you. second. Thank you for being I second that. Business. Good luck with this. I really appreciate your help. Uh, yeah, I know you guys are digging up pictures for me, and I can't yeah. wait to see what you got. And uh, thanks so much. And just let everybody know where they can get in touch with you if they'd like to get in touch with you. 
Scott? Like, uh, you want me to give out my phone number? Well, uh, whatever, your email or your... Uh, Scott Miller Time. Scott Miller Time at Hotmail.com. Email me. Come on, world. <laughs> Hotmail? Yeah, I still have a Hotmail account. Oh, sorry. Get off my lawn. Yeah, I still have Gmail too. Scott Miller Time at Gmail dot com. Is that up to Is that up to speed, Kevin? I still have, I still have an AOL account, so my contact oh. is, is uh, a dinosaur. It's yeah. Robinson Radio. R O B I N S O N. Okay. Radio at AOL dot com. Okay, great. Thank you, gentlemen. This has really been fun. Thank you, Pam. Any thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you. Mwah. Kisses for both. Mwah. Oh. In, in coronavirus guy. territory. Uh-oh. Where's really my mask? <laughs> all right. You guys take care. Bye-bye. Thanks. Thanks. Bye to all of our viewers today, and thanks for tuning in. I hope everybody's being safe and uh, staying well. And you know what? Spring is coming, and the sun is shining, so things are looking up. Yep. Exactly right. Bye-bye. Bye.